In this chapter, we'll take a look at MNT and cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease includes diseases like coronary heart disease, atherosclerosis, hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, and heart failure. And so looking at some stats on cardiovascular disease, so it remains the number one killer of both men and women in the US. One in three Americans have one or more types of cardiovascular disease, and it causes one of every 2.9 deaths. Every minute, someone in the United States dies from a coronary event, and 1.26 million Americans had a new or recurrent coronary attack in 2010. 80 million American adults live with one or more cardiovascular diseases, and $475 billion a year in direct and indirect costs in 2019. But the death rate has dropped 40% in the past three years. And you'll see why that affects some of the other stats. So looking at how people can have multiple cardiovascular diseases or this high ongoing cost is because more people are surviving cardiovascular disease. So here we have the types and incidences of cardiovascular disease uh, in 2010, sort of from the American Heart Association. So with hypertension, you're at 74 and a half million. Coronary heart disease, 17.6 million. And myocardial infarction, or an MI, 8.5 million. Angina pectoris, 10.2 million. Heart failure, 5.8 million. And stroke, 6.4 million. So looking at the functions of the heart, so we're looking at the regulation of blood flow to the tissues in order to deliver oxygenated blood and nutrients, along with thermoregulation, hormotransport, maintenance of fluid volume, regulation of pH, and gas exchange. So looking at the anatomy of the heart, we have three layers. We have the epicardium, which is the outer, the endocardium, which is the inner, and the myocardium, which is the middle layer. It's also the muscle layer, myo for muscle, and is responsible for muscle contraction. Now you have four chambers to the heart. You have the right atria and the right ventricle, which pump blood through pulmonary circulation for oxygenation. And you have the left atria and left ventricles, which pump oxygenated blood through systemic circulation. So here you can see, right, so the, on the left side, remember this is the anatomical left, so in your picture this is the red, goes to the heart, and then the blue, which is the anatomical right side, is going to go to the lungs for oxygenation. So coronary heart disease involves the narrowing of small vessels that oxygenate the heart muscle, also known as coronary artery disease. And so a myocardial infarction, or MI, is ischemia in one or more of the coronary arteries with tissue damage and is responsible for most cardiovascular deaths. Now, just as a reminder, right, ischemia is adequate blood supply. In this case, we're focusing on a lack of blood supply to the heart. And so a prolonged and severe ischemia is what actually causes the MI. Now we now have what's known as atherosclerosis. So when I was in school, we had athero and arteriosclerosis. Now it's kind of lumped together into one disease. So looking at atherosclerosis, so we have atherogenesis, which is the process leading to the development of atherosclerosis. So chronic inflammatory response to risk factors that are injurious to the arterial wall. We have the attraction of platelets and we begin forming a small clot known as a thrombus, or if there's more of them, thrombi. And so continued migration of cells to the area. We then have a proliferation of the plaque and eventually we have a rupture of this fibrous cap. Now, atherosclerotic heart disease involves narrowing and a loss of elasticity in the blood vessel wall caused by an accumulation of plaque. So athero meaning the artery and sclerosis is hardening. So imagine though, if you were to fill a garden hose with sand or in this case, a plaque, it becomes less bendable. Inflammation stimulates a response by the monocytes, the phagocytic white blood cells, which evolve into macrophages that ingest oxidized cholesterol and become foam cells. And then we have the development of fatty streaks in the vessels. So here you can see this development. So we have a mature atherosclerotic plaque. So again, here the problem is that it could rupture. We have a stable plaque, which has a much smaller core and then we have an unstable plaque, which is very likely to rupture. Now you can see here we have a timeline of age, and we can see the blood vessels as they begin filling with fat. So again, we have this deposition. So it starts as a fatty streak, our fibrous plaque, and then advanced plaques. 
and you can see they become narrow and narrower with age. And so here we can see our monocytes, which again, this development of fatty streaks, and again, the eventual development of plaques. Now here you can see a plaque that's been surgically removed from the coronary artery. And so you can see this is in centimeters. So this is quite large. This is um, this was severely uh, restricting blood flow to the heart. So over time, the plaque begins to calcify and again will re result in restriction of blood flow. And this can cause, again, most famously myocardial infarctions, but also cerebrovascular accidents or CVAs or strokes, peripheral vascular disease and heart failure. And so arterial changes begin in infancy and progress throughout adulthood. And atherosclerosis, similar to hypertension, is a silent disease, as many individuals are asymptomatic until their first heart attack. Now, in coronary arteries, atherosclerosis causes angina, that is angina, MI, and sudden death. And so angina is the chest pain caused by oxygen deficit to the heart. Now, there's two different types. We have a stable angina which has a predictable pattern. So this is, for example, when you climb up the steps too quickly and you're like, ooh, my chest hurts, or it's cold out, or you're stressed. And we also have unstable angina, which is unpredictable. This is an emergent situation and predicts an oncoming heart attack. So this is having a, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't feel so good, and you have chest pain. That's unstable. In cerebral arteries, atherosclerosis causes strokes and TIAs. And in peripheral circulation, atherosclerosis causes intermittent claudication limb ischemia and gangrene and so claudication is the fancy word for cramping in the calves caused by poor circulation so again here you can see the locations so we have ischemic strokes and transient ischemic attacks in the brain mis angina pectoris so chest pain sudden death and then in the legs we have intermittent claudication critical limb ischemia gangrene and necrosis Now, we also have to take into consideration dyslipidemia. And so this is a blood profile that increases the risk of developing atherosclerosis, typically involves elevated LDL levels and low HDL levels. And so the three important biochemical markers for cardiovascular disease is we look at lipoproteins, total cholesterol, and triglycerides. Now, looking at the lipoproteins, we're going to go a little bit more in depth than we did in our lab lectures. So these are lipids that are carried in the blood bound to protein. And so lipoproteins with the highest level of protein are most dense, right? Because protein sinks, whereas the fat floats. And the lipoproteins that are measured in clinical practice include chylomicrons, very low density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins, and high density lipoproteins. So looking at chylomicrons, these are our largest particles. They transport dietary, they transport dietary fat and cholesterol from small intestine to the liver and the periphery. Once in the bloodstream, triglycerides within chylomicrons are hydrolyzed by lipoprotein lipase. And apolipoproteins carry lipids in the blood and also control the metabolism of the lipoprotein molecule. Very low density lipoproteins are synthesized in the liver to transport endogenous to transport endogenous triglyceride and cholesterol. These are believed to be non-atherogenic due to their large size. However, the smaller remnants formed from triglyceride hydrolysis by lipoprotein lipase are atherogenic and are called intermediate density lipoproteins. And so IPLs are taken up by the receptors on the liver and converted to LDLs. Low density lipoproteins or LDLs are the primary cholesterol carrier in the blood, and these are formed by the breakdown of VLDLs. And apolipoprotein B, or ApoB, constitutes 95% of the apolipoproteins in LDL. And so a high LDL is associated with atherosclerosis, and LDL is the single strongest indicator of heart disease. So this is the quote unquote bad cholesterol. So here we have our numbers for LDL. So again, we'd like to see less than 100. Now looking at high density lipoproteins, these contain more protein, which is why they're denser than other lipoproteins. 
And so apolipoprotein A, or ApoA, is the main lipoprotein in HDL. It's an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant protein that helps to remove cholesterol from the arterial wall to the liver. So this is the good one, right? So the lower the ratio of ApoB to ApoA, the lower the risk of coronary heart disease, and high levels of HDLs are associated with lower atherosclerotic risk. So again, this is the good cholesterol. So again, here we have our numbers. So again, less than 40 for men is bad and less than 50 is bad for women. Now looking at total cholesterol, so this measurement includes cholesterol contained in all lipoprotein fractions, 60 to 70%, which is carried on LDL, 20 to 30% carried on HDL, and 10 to 15% carried on VLDL. And so studies consistently show that high serum cholesterol is one of the main causes of coronary heart disease, stroke, and mortality. And so again, you'll see the, the diagnosis of hypercholesterolemia or high cholesterol of the blood. So again, here we have our numbers. And while we still care about total number, again, we're also caring a lot more about ratio and HDL than we previously did, but total still matters. Now looking at triglycerides, so chylomicrons and VLDLs are triglyceride rich. Also triglycerides found in remnants or intermediary products formed in metabolism. And individuals with familial dyslipidemia have high triglyceride levels. And so again, you'll see this as hypertriglyceridemia or high triglycerides of the blood. And so again, here we have our range, where again, we'd like to see these as less than 150, but less than 100 is ideal. So as we were saying, we're now more focused on our cholesterol and HDL ratio. So if your total cholesterol is 200 and your HDL is 50, then your ratio is four to one. So your goal is to keep cholesterol ratio at five to one or lower, and an optimal ratio is 3.5 to one. And a higher ratio indicates a higher risk of heart disease a lower ratio indicates a lower risk. So looking at lipid profile, again, so the panel of blood tests that serves as a broad medical screening tool for abnormalities in lipids. And so again, this needs to be done after 12 hours of fasting. So many people are guilty of no food after midnight, but then they'll set their appointment for 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. because they don't wanna fast all day. But if you wanna actually see the levels, it needs to be 12 hours of fasting. And again, this looks at total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and the cholesterol to HDL ratio. Now looking at inflammatory markers, so we talked a little bit about these previously in looking at the lab chapter. We're now looking at fibrinogen, which is a marker of vascular damage, elevated with smoking, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, elevated triglycerides, and genetic factors. C-reactive protein is elevated during atherogenesis, which is an inflammatory process. Although C-reactive protein is not specific to the heart and vascular system, so increased CRP requires further investigation as there could be some other cause for this inflammation. And homocysteine, so elevated homocysteine increases the odds for a stroke. And again, we've talked previously looking at this cycle between methionine and homocysteine. So B12, B6, and folate may help lower levels of homocysteine. So looking at the biological markers to diagnose MI or to diagnose a heart attack, we look at creatine kinase and cardiac troponin T or cardiac troponins. So here you can see those numbers, which again, not as important from an MNT standpoint so much as you just understand if the doctor is documenting a patient's case, how recently they've had the heart attack, are they recovering from it, are the levels going down, etc. So looking at are modifiable risk factors, so poor diet quality with inadequate fiber, excessive calories and fat, looking at physical inactivity, so an increase in activity decreases blood pressure, decre decreases triglycerides and raises HDL, and weight management, so again maintaining a healthy body weight, and again physical activity can help improve glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. Looking at stress, the neurohormonal response results in increased heart rate, BP, and cardiac excitability. 
and smoking, so again, directly influences thrombus formation, plaque instability, and arrhythmias. So looking at controllable risk factors, so metabolic syndrome, low HDL and high LDL is correlated with an increased risk. Looking at hypertension, an increase in blood pressure increases forces applied to the endothelium and can cause the initiation of atherosclerotic lesions. Looking at diabetes, coronary artery disease is most common cause of death in patients with diabetes mellitus. So the diabetes is then what actually kills them. It's coronary artery disease. Looking at obesity, BMI directly correlates with risk for coronary heart disease. And carrying excessive adipose tissue causes greater work for the heart. And weight distribution is a predictor for coronary heart disease, again with that visceral or abdominal fat being a higher predictor. Looking at non-modifiable risk factors, we have family history. So a positive family history influences the intensity of risk factor management. Looking at age, so plaques develop over a period of time. So there's a direct correlation with age and risk for atherosclerosis. Looking at sex, males develop atherosclerosis faster than females, but differences decline after females reach menopause and menopausal status. So again, endogenous estrogen protects against cardiovascular disease. So testosterone increases risk and estrogen protects from risk. And so here you have a nice little cheat sheet for major risk factors, modifiable risk factors, lifestyle risk factors, and related conditions. So looking at medical nutrition therapy for coronary heart disease, again, we'd like to see an RD referral from the physician and the academy recommends an initial visit of 45 to 90 minutes, followed by two to six follow-up visits of 30 to 60 minutes each. And again, diet therapy should be pursued before drug therapy, with the exception, of course, of things like blood thinners, which are an emergency treatment to again, make sure a patient does not immediately have a secondary event. And the TLC dietary pattern is used for the prevention of coronary heart disease. Now factors that lower HDL, so this is from the American Heart Association. So again, we want our HDL to be higher. These are things that lower it, so this is bad. Smoking, being overweight or obese, physical inactivity, stress, genetic factors, type two diabetes, and certain drugs such as beta blockers and anabolic androgenic steroids. Factors that raise triglycerides include smoking, being overweight or obese, physical inactivity, excessive alcohol consumption, a diet very high in carbohydrates, which is meaning more than 60% of total calories, underlying diseases or genetic disorders that are sometimes the cause of high triglycerides. So nutritional factors that affect LDL cholesterol. So things that increase LDL are saturated and trans fats, dietary cholesterol and excessive body weight. Things that decrease LDL include polyunsaturated fats, fiber, plant stanols and sterols, weight loss, isoflavone containing soy protein, which is pretty weak evidence, and soy protein, which again is still fairly weak evidence. So the therapeutic lifestyle changes or the TLC diet, we see 25 to 35% of total calories from fat, less than 7% from saturated fat, no trans fats, up to 10% of calories from polyunsaturated fats, up to 20% from monounsaturated fats, that's your olive oil, 50 to 60% of calories from carbohydrates with a focus on whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day, although even more for men at 38 grams per day, plant sterols at two grams, that's your Benacol, protein approximately 15% of total calories with cholesterol less than 200 milligrams per day, and again, balancing energy intake and expenditure to maintain a desirable body weight and prevent excessive weight gain. So here you can see the American Heart Association diet recommendations for cardiovascular disease reduction. You'll notice they're very similar to the TLC diet and the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and all of these diets are very similar. Uh, again, some of them are more numbers focused, some of them are more food groups focused, but when you run the numbers, they're all pretty much saying the same thing. So high fat diets of people in the Mediterranean countries are associated with low blood cholesterol levels and coronary heart disease incidence. And again, looking at, so our main source of fat being olive oil, which is high in our monounsaturated fatty acids, 
And again, the Mediterranean diet emphasizes fruits, root vegetables, leafy green vegetables, breads and cereals, fish, flax, canola oil, vegetable oil products, nuts, seeds, and red wine, and may reduce cardiovascular disease by 50 to 70%. And so again, what we see here is a very similar dietary pattern, again, that's less numbers focused though, and more food group focused. So here we can see, and again, the other big thing is looking at lifestyle. So again, physical activity, and the other major component though, is a reduction in stress. We talked about that neurohormonal response, right? And so the amount of stress and how it can affect cardiovascular disease risk. Now looking at omega-3 fatty acids, specifically EPA and DHA. So these are high in fish oils, fish oil capsules, and ocean cold water fish, so salmon, mackerel, tuna, and sardines. And studies show eating fish is associated with lower cardiovascular disease risk. And they appear to be cardioprotective because they interfere with blood clotting and alter prostaglandin synthesis. They can stimulate the production of nitric oxide, which again helps relax the blood vessel walls. And so a high intake though can prolong a bleeding time. So especially if patients have had things like hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding issues, right? This can cause some conflicts and some issues. Looking at fiber, so a high fiber intake associated with significantly lower prevalence of coronary heart disease and stroke. Soluble fibers in pectins, gums, mucilages, algal polysaccharides particularly can lower LDL cholesterol. Insoluble fibers such as cellulose and lignin have no effect on serum cholesterol levels, so it's not your bran flakes. These are your things that gel. And again, the currently proposed mechanism for our understanding, so fiber binds with bile acids, which lower serum cholesterol because the bile acids are not reabsorbed by the body and the pool is depleted. And so then what happens is, is the body then has to pull cholesterol from the blood to create new bile. And bacteria in the colon ferment the fiber to produce acetate and propionate and butyrate, which can also help inhibit cholesterol synthesis. So we've got a couple different mechanisms that all has to do with the binding of the fiber with the bile and being excreted and or being metabolized. Looking at antioxidants, vitamin E prevents the oxidation of the PUFAs in the cell membrane. Although the American Heart Association does not recommend vitamin E supplementation to prevent cardiovascular disease. And so looking at the natural form of vitamin E shows promise though as an anti-inflammatory agent. And foods with concentrated amounts of catechins have been found to improve vascular reactivity. And so these are your famous foods that you'll hear, that you'll look at through uh, different blue zones and throughout the world is things like red grapes, red wine, green tea, chocolate, and olive oil. Looking at plant stanols and sterols. So these are isolated from soybean oils and pine tree oils. So these lower dietary cholesterol by inhibiting absorption of dietary cholesterol. And so there are specific brands of margarine such as Benicol that contain these, but they can affect the absorption of beta carotene, alpha tocopherols and lycopene. And so further research is warranted. Now looking at the medical management of coronary heart disease. So there's several different uh, drugs. So we have bile acid sequestrants, nicotinic acid, statins or 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutarol coenzyme A or HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, fibric acid derivatives, and probuchal. We also have surgical options like percutaneous coronary interventions. These were formerly known as percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. So this is a procedure that uses a catheter with a balloon that is inflated and breaks up the plaque deposits in occluded arteries and may involve coronary stenting by inserting a wire mesh tube into an artery to hold it open. Now what's nice about these is this only requires local anesthesia, so especially when we're looking at elderly patients where the anesthesia can be much higher risk. And so here you can see the stenting. So again, we're actually gonna go through with the catheter, with the balloon, and then on the right, you see the actual placement of the stent, which is that wire mesh tube. The more significant surgical option is coronary artery bypass grafting or cabbage. So a healthy artery or vein from the body is connected or grafted to the blocked artery. And then the grafted artery or vein bypasses the blocked portion of the coronary artery to create a new path for oxygen rich blood to flow to the heart muscle. 
and candidates typically have at least two occluded arteries and receive general anesthesia. And so this is considered a major surgery. And so these patients will actually end up in the ICU for several days. That's the difference with a stent is somebody would come in, get their stent done on Monday, and they could even leave Tuesday, possibly Wednesday at the latest. Um, whereas this is, you know, you're looking at uh, up to about a week in the hospital and, and a day or two in the ICU to make sure that everything is recovered and working well. And so here you can see, so this is the famous, right, you'll see the famous chest car, scar from a cabbage along, right, with the harvesting, right, so which it usually comes from in the leg. Again, so this alternative vein to then redirect the blood flow. Now we'll talk about aneurysms. So this is an outward bulging of the wall of the blood vessel. And so this is common in the aorta in what's known as an abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is incredibly dangerous. Now this can be caused by atherosclerosis, hypertension, or sometimes trauma, infection, or a hereditary issue. And so when the size of the aneurysm increases, there's a significant risk of rupture, resulting in severe hemorrhage and or other complications, including death. And that's the biggest issue with an abdominal aortic aneurysm, is that due to the size of the blood vessel, is that if it ruptures, there's a very high risk of death, as getting someone into surgery and surgically opened up fast enough becomes a very real issue. And so here you can see the bulging that we're talking about with an abdominal aortic aneurysm. So looking at hypertension, so this is chronic and persistent elevated arterial blood pressure. And so arterial blood pressure is the force exerted by blood against the walls of the arteries over a cardiac cycle. And this represents the resistance against which the ventricles must contract in order to eject blood into systemic circulation. And so one in three adults in the U.S. has hypertension. And again, this is considered a silent killer. So again, it can be asymptomatic and then a patient may have a fatal stroke or heart attack. And so there's no cure for hypertension, but it's easily detectable and highly controllable. So let's talk a little bit more about blood pressure. So systolic blood pressure is the force exerted by the blood on the walls of the blood vessel during contraction of the ventricles. So this measures the pressure in the arteries when the heart's beating. And so it's considered to be hypertensive if you're over 120 millimeters of mercury. Diastolic blood pressure is the force exerted by the blood on the walls of blood vessel during relaxation of the ventricles. So this measures the pressure in the arteries between heartbeats when the heart muscle is resting between beats and refilling with blood. And again, it's considered hypertensive if it's over 80 millimeters of mercury. And hypertension exists if either systolic or diastolic pressure is high. Now the way we measure this is a sphygmomanometer, and so AKA a blood pressure cuff. So an instrument is usually attached to an inflatable air bladder cuff and is used with a stethoscope for measuring blood pressure in an artery. So when we are back on campus, I can show you how to do this. Now a single high reading though does not necessarily mean that the patient has high blood pressure. And something to consider is which number is more important, the systolic or diastolic. And typically more attention is given to the systolic or top number as a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease for people over the age of 50. And in most people, systolic blood pressure rises steadily with age due to increasing stiffness of large arteries, long-term buildup of plaque, and increased incidence of cardiac and vascular disease. So here you can see your cutoffs for your different blood pressures. Now looking at the prevalence and incidence of hypertension, so non-Hispanic black adults have higher prevalence of 43% men and 44.8% women than non-Hispanic white adults at 34.3% and 31.3% for women. Prevalence increases with age and obesity, and the higher the blood pressure, the greater the risk for organ damage, including left ventricular hypertrophy, stroke, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, and retinopathy. Now here we can see some data. So this is age specific and age adjusted prevalence of hypertension in adults. So we can see again that hypertension, especially with that rising systolic pressure, is very common in the elderly. We can then also see it's slightly higher in men. And we can also look at racial and ethnic data to again see that it's lower in Mexican Americans and higher in non-Hispanic Black Americans. So remember that blood pressure is cardiac output times peripheral resistance and that the diameter of the blood vessel affects blood flow. 
So when the diameter is decreased, resistance and blood pressure increases, as is the case, for example, with atherosclerosis. And when the diameter is increased, resistance decreases and blood pressure is lowered, for example, with vasodilator drug therapy. And this is because the water in the blood right, is a non-compressible fluid. So changing the diameter of the vessel is what changes the pressure. Now we have different types. We have primary or essential hypertension, which is idiopathic, aka it has an unknown cause, it just happens. So this is 90% of all cases and likely involves an interaction between poor lifestyle choices and gene expression. But we also have secondary hypertension, and this occurs as a result of another disease process and can be cured. So for example, if someone has renal disease or diabetes, if we treat that underlying condition, their blood pressure will return to a normal range. So let's talk about homeostatic control of blood pressure. So when the sympathetic nervous system is overstimulated, excessive norepinephrine, which is a vasoconstrictor, is released, and this causes an increase in peripheral resistance, raising blood pressure and heart rate. Now this can be caused, though, for example, by things like sleep apnea and adrenal disorders. Smoking also causes vasoconstriction and elevates blood pressure. Renal disease causes an increase in blood pressure due to sodium, chloride, and water retention, which increases total blood volume. Now again, we said that due to the non-compressible nature of fluids, specifically water, the only way to fix this would be through vasodilation, but the body can only accommodate that so much. And so again, with increased water retention, we see an increase in blood pressure. The kidneys regulate blood pressure by controlling extracellular fluid volume and secreting renin, which is a hormone that activates the renin-angiotensin system. Increased production of angiotensin-converting enzyme and angiotensinogen can occur when the RAS gene is defective. This causes increased production of angiotensin II, which increases blood pressure by vasoconstriction and fluid retention. So here you can see that system. So again, we've talked about the system a little bit previously, but going through it again, that we can see that again, this is due to a genetic change where again, excessive amounts of these hormones would then cause an increase in blood pressure. So again, looking at the hormonal regulation of blood pressure, so again, there's several hormones involved, including norepinephrine, which increases heart rate, vasopressin, aka antidiuretic hormone, which causes an increase in reabsorption of water, which causes an increase in blood volume, leading to increased blood pressure. And angiotensin II causes an increase in sodium and chloride reabsorption, which causes water to be retained, and again, leads to an increase in blood pressure. So again, looking at the prevention of hypertension, so awareness, treatment, and control of hypertension have increased over the last several years. So again, as we've increased our knowledge and disseminated this information, so more people are aware of these recommendations. So one strategy is to lower blood pressure in those with prehypertension by changing lifestyle factors, weight management, and following the Academy's EAL recommendations. So here you can see the EAL's recommendations. Again, you know, this is very similar to a DASH or TLC diet. Um, now, again, the TLC diet is technically focused on cholesterol, but again, cardiovascular health, they all kind of tie together. This is very similar to the Mediterranean diet. Um, again, what we see is an emphasis on fruits and vegetables, decreasing sodium, getting adequate physical activity, weight management, moderate to little alcohol consumption, so definitely not excessive, and then looking at calcium and magnesium as possibilities, omega-3 fatty acids, and potassium. Now looking at the medical management of hypertension. So again, what's supposed to happen is several months of compliant lifestyle modifications should be attempted before there's any drug therapy. And so the management of hypertension though does require lifelong commitment. So you don't get over hypertension like you get over a cold, right? So you know, once you've developed hypertension, if you can then control it with dietary and lifestyle interventions, those must be maintained. Now, pharmacological therapy is necessary, though, if blood pressure remains elevated for 6 to 12 months after actually implementing lifestyle changes. So standard drug therapy includes diuretics, and these lower blood pressure by promoting volume depletion and sodium loss. 
This is most often done, for example, what you'll see is when you're looking at diuretics that end in "-ide", like furosemide, aka Lasix. Beta blockers block the action of epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are drugs that end in "-all", like metoprolol. We have ACE inhibitors, which often end in "-ril", like lisinopril. And calcium channel blockers reduce or prevent the passage of calcium, causing the blood vessels to relax. And these end in "-ene", like amylodipine or norvasc. So here you can see a larger category of the drugs and the different brand names. Now going a little bit more detail on diuretics, and again, there's some cheat sheets here again where you said what their endings are. There are exceptions, of course, but again, it just kind of helps with memory. So looking at our loop diuretics or potassium wasting, these are things like furosemide, and so these inhibit sodium chloride and potassium reabsorption in the loop of Henle. We have thiazides, which are also potassium wasting. And these are things like hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ. And these inhibit the resorption of sodium chloride and potassium in the distal tubule. And these do though contribute to a risk of hypokalemia. We also have potassium sparing diuretics like spironolactone which prevent the sodium potassium exchange in the collecting and convoluted tubules. And these though carry the risk of hyperkalemia. So again, this can be caused too much potassium. Looking at our energy intake for each kilogram lost, reductions in systolic and diastolic blood pressure of approximately one millimeter of mercury are expected. And so if the patient's 115% of their ideal body weight Again, weight reduction may significantly contribute to improved blood pressure management. Again, the DASH diet, which is used for the prevention and control of hypertension, with a focus on fruit and vegetable intake, and decreasing meats, fats, and sweets. Looking at our salt restrictions, so we recommend less than 2,400 milligrams of sodium per day per the dietary guidelines. And if someone has hypertension, is black, middle-aged, or elderly, we recommend less than 1500 milligrams. And so I can actually show you all where this information is found in the EAL. And so what we actually look at is we see is that there's a gene. And so this gene is more prominent in, his, in African Americans, which is why we recommend that despite age, we reduce sodium early on. If you don't have this gene, again, we're not nearly as concerned about sodium, but we still wanna keep it at less than 2400 milligrams per day. Avoid processed foods canned foods, deli meats, and eating out. And again, so future strategy, so looking at the National Academy of Sciences and the Institutes of Medicine involves a mandatory national sodium level standard for foods, um, but again, we're not there yet. Now looking at some food labeling guidelines to see how much sodium is actually in food, so you'll see your sodium free, very low and low sodium, versus your reduced sodium, which again, 25% less, for some foods is really not that much. I'm looking at you, soy sauce. Looking at potassium, so diets rich in potassium lower blood pressure and blunt the effects of salt on blood pressure in some specifically sensitive individuals. Looking again, we said at calcium and magnesium where we said we had that fair evidence. May have blood pressure benefits, but not enough data available to support specific recommendations. But typically what happens is, is the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet, right, encourages foods that are good sources of potassium, calcium, and magnesium naturally. So current research does not indicate omega-3s influence blood pressure, though they do affect other aspects of cardiovascular health. Remember, this is happening in a bigger picture. Alcohol intake should be limited to no more than two drinks a day for men and no more than one drink a day for women. 30 to 45 minutes of brisk walking on most days of the week is recommended for the management and prevention of hypertension. 60 to 90 minutes is recommended if trying to lower weight or maintain a new lower body weight. Now looking at the treatment of hypertension in children and adolescents, the prevalence of hypertension is rising with obesity rates and increased intakes of high calorie, high salt foods, and intrauterine growth retardation can lead to hypertension in childhood. Secondary hypertension, though, is more common in children than primary hypertension, and weight reduction is the primary therapy for obesity-related hypertension in children and adolescents. And looking at treatment of hypertension in older adults, so more than 50% of older, those over the age of 65, have hypertension, 
and blood pressure though should still be controlled regardless of age and losing weight and decreasing sodium intake are the most effective means drug treatment though is also well supported in older adults and severe sodium restrictions though are not adopted because they can lead to volume depletion in older adults with renal damage so we don't want you to have such low sodium and blood pressure levels that you're passing out now we do have so again does any of this actually work where do these, how do we know these recommendations are the real deal so we do have for example the premier trial so this was a randomized trial with 810 adults and participants were in one of three groups the established which is a behavioral intervention that implemented the established recommendations the established plus the dash diet so it's the standard recommendations plus a dash diet and those who just received some counseling and so the main outcome measure was blood pressure man management and hypertension at six months and so the results both behavioral interventions significantly reduced weight improved fitness and lowered sodium intake and the conclusion was that individuals with above optimal blood pressure, including stage one hypertension, can make multiple lifestyle changes that lower blood pressure and reduce their cardiovascular disease risk. So here we can see, so we have our hypertensive at six months percentages, and again, hypertension status at baseline. So you can then see our non-hypertensive, hypertensive, and all. And so we can see then, right, so the best numbers we see is the established plus dash. So moving into heart failure, so this was formerly called congestive heart failure, and I can tell you it's still called congestive heart failure most of the time uh, at the hospital. So this occurs when the heart cannot provide adequate blood flow to the rest of the body, causing symptoms of fatigue, dyspnea, shortness of breath, and fluid retention. And so this is a diseases of the heart valves, muscle, and blood vessels. Can lead to heart failure now heart failure is a progressive disease so again it's some amount of damage to the heart and then gets worse and worse heart failure can be left or right sided or both and so we have systolic heart failure where the heart cannot pump or eject blood efficiently and diastolic heart failure where the heart cannot fill with blood properly so talking a little bit more about cardiac function so we have stroke volume which is the volume of blood ejected with each contraction or squeezing of the left ventricle. And we have end diastolic volume, which is the amount of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole. Now, the greater the EDV, the more the ventricles are stretched. Ejection fraction is the fraction of EDV that is ejected from the heart by contraction of the left ventricle. And so per the American Heart Association, Ejection fraction is a measurement of how much blood the left ventricle pumps out with each contraction with a normal ejection fraction of 55 to 70%. And so for example, an ejection fraction of 60 means that 60% of the total amount of blood in the left ventricle is pushed out with each heartbeat. So here we can see again, looking at that circulation in the left ventricle, Remember that is the anatomical left. So remember, it's not the picture. It's you have to actually look at if it were in your own body. So again, you're looking at the quote unquote, the red side of the heart. Now the prevalence of heart failure increases with age as this affects more than 5 million Americans. And the incidence of new cases during the last 20 years due to an aging population, increased obesity and increase in being saved after a heart attacks has actually increased the amount of heart failure. And so the number of people discharged with a diagnosis of heart failure increased from 877,000 to 1.1 million over a 10 year span of time. And again, this is because we're getting better at treating heart disease. So more people survive heart attacks. Now we have different classes of heart failure, one through four, with class one having no undue symptoms associated with ordinary activity and no limits on physical activity. With class four, the inability to carry out physical activity without discomfort and symptoms of cardiac insufficiency or chest pain at rest. And then of course, classes two and three are in the middle. Now heart failure is initiated by damage or stress to the heart muscle due to either an acute heart attack or insidious onset. And so we have what's known as cardiac remodeling and this occurs as the insult alters the function and shape of the left ventricle, causing it to become hypertrophic in order to sustain blood flow. Now, one thing we do monitor is B natriuretic peptide or BNP, as this is secreted by the ventricles in response to pressure 
and is predictive of the severity of heart failure and the risk of death. So BNP levels less than 100 picograms indicate no heart failure. 100 to 300 indicate heart failure is present. More than 300 is mild. More than 600 is moderate. And more than 900 is severe. Pro-inflammatory cytokines are increased in blood and myocardium to regulate cardiac remodeling, including TNF, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6. And increased levels of norepinephrine angiotensin-2, aldosterone, and endothelin, which are vasoconstructive peptides, and vasopressin are typically seen in patients with heart failure. And so what we see is so increased stress to the ventricle by causing sodium retention and peripheral vasoconstriction. Now heart failure can compensate for poor cardiac output by increasing the force of contraction, increasing the size, which is that hypertrophy, pumping more often, which is heart rate, and stimulating the kidneys to conserve water and sodium. The heart though cannot continue to maintain normal output by decompensation with no symptoms and advanced symptoms though will ultimately develop. So the three main symptoms are fatigue, shortness of breath, and fluid retention. And so shortness of breath on exertion is the earliest symptom and shortness of breath occurs. And so what we'll see is orthopnea We'll also see though is shortness of breath at night with paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And fluid retention can manifest as pulmonary congestion or peripheral edema. And so what you're actually seeing is that fluid in the lungs, which is why this was previously called congestive heart failure. And we do see what's known as hypoperfusion, which results in cool forearms and legs, sleepiness, and declining sodium levels due to fluid overload and worsening renal function. Decreased cranial blood supply to the brain can lead to mental confusion, memory loss, anxiety, insomnia, headaches, and syncope, which is a loss of oxygen to the brain, causing a brief loss of consciousness. So if you ever stood up and you see stars and you feel kind of woozy, when people pass out from that, that is syncope. Now heart failure can also lead to cardiac cachexia, which is a serious complication of heart failure with poor prognosis and a high mortality rate. And it's the end result of heart failure in 10 to 15% of patients. So its definition is involuntary weight loss of at least 6% of non edematous body weight during a six month period of time. And this is characterized by lean body mass loss, which further exacerbates heart failure due to a loss of cardiac muscle and the heart becoming soft and flabby. So signs and symptoms of cardiac cachexia include malnutrition, extreme skeletal muscle wasting, fatigue, and inadequate blood supply to the abdominal organs, causing poor appetite, nausea, constipation, abdominal pain, feeling of fullness, malabsorption, hepatomegaly, and liver tenderness. And so looking at heart failure in the middle age versus older adulthood, so again, we have different causes. So you can see in middle age, it's much less frequent, more common in men, normally caused by coronary artery disease with typical features, with few comorbidities. Now in older adulthood, you see a much higher prevalence, more common in women, usually caused by hypertension with abnormal or atypical clinical features. Now looking at risk factors, so we do have the Framingham Heart Study so risk factors for heart failure include hypertension, diabetes, coronary heart disease, and left ventricular hypertrophy, or again in the enlarged left ventricle. Also waist circumference, percent body fat, smoking, physical activity, psychosocial factors, menopause, obesity, and HDL are all predictors for heart failure. With a new focus looking at genes, and so looking again at gene expression as predictors. And so here we have again, so this is just the principal effects of aging on cardiovascular structure and function, where again, we'll see increased vascular stiffness, increased myocardial stiffness, decreased beta adrenergic responsiveness, impaired mitochondrial ATP production, decreased baroreceptor responsiveness, impaired sinus node function, and impaired endothelial function. So the net effect we see is a marked reduction in cardiovascular reserve. 
Now looking at the medical management, so we're looking at is a sodium restriction, regular activity as tolerated, so don't push themselves too hard, but we still want them to continue to exercise. We have a standard fluid restriction of 2 liters a day, and this may need to be decreased to 1 to 1.5 liters if there's severe decompensation. ACE inhibitors initially, and then beta blockers or an angiotensin receptor blocker may be added. And in stage C or D, diuretics, aldosterone antagonists, digitalis, and vasodilators may all be used. Now looking at a screening for heart failure, so again, we want to determine dry body weight, and so daily weights should be recorded at the same time each day, typically in the morning after the first void. And again, what you would do is the patient would notify their physician if they've noticed a weight gain of more than one pound per day in severe heart failure, two pounds per day in moderate, and three to five pounds per day in mild. So we want these patients to weigh themselves every morning, and if they have any major changes, they need to contact their doctor immediately. And again, we're concerned about from a nutrition standpoint, malnutrition and cardiac cachexia. Looking at salt restrictions, so sodium and fluid accumulates in the tissues causing edema. And so the degree of salt or sodium restriction will depend on the individual with 1,200, 2,400 milligrams per day recommended for most heart failure patients. But again, we want to choose the least restrictive diet that will still achieve the desired results. Because again, our biggest thing here is we don't want them to develop the wasting and the cachexia, so they still have to eat their food. Now, adherence can be problematic for some individuals based on ethnic, cultural, or traditional diets that are high in sodium. For example, uh, the traditional Asian diet and the Southern American diet are very high in sodium. Other issues for compliance can include memory loss, fatigue, so they're too tired to cook and they'll just use convenience foods like Mrs. Stouffer's that are very high in sodium or economic issues. So again, using canned goods or other cost-effective food choices. So here you just have a nice little convenient list for top 10 categories of high sodium foods. This is your processed or salted meats, tomato juices, meat extracts, salty snacks, sauces, dressings, etc., packaged mixes, cheeses, frozen entrees, canned foods, and foods eaten away from home. Now again, looking at sodium, so again, we can typically describe this to patients as being one teaspoon of salt. Now the reason for that is it has to do with the atomic weights, which is the fact that although table salt is sodium chloride, so that's one molecule sodium, one molecule of chloride, the chloride molecule is actually fairly larger than the sodium molecule, so it's not 50% of the weight. It's actually just under 40% of the weight. Uh, and so you can see this calculation here then to see how much actual sodium is in salt. Looking at alcohol, we know this contributes to total fluid intake and can raise blood pressure. So for patients with heart failure, we recommend to avoid alcohol completely. And chronic alcohol intake can lead to cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Now we need to take into account the quantity, drinking patterns, and genetic factors which helps influence the relationship with heart failure and alcohol. Now if patients are still not going to listen to us, then we want to make sure that they're not exceeding two drinks a day for men and one drink a day for women. Looking at caffeine, this is thought to be detrimental due to its contribution to irregular heartbeat. However, new research indicates that moderate intake of tea or coffee can actually reduce coronary heart disease risk, which again, that's what actually leads to the heart failure in many patients. Looking at calcium, heart failure patients are at risk for osteoporosis due to low activity levels, impaired renal functions, and drugs that alter calcium absorption. But we do need to be careful with calcium supplements as they may aggravate cardiac arrhythmias. Looking at coenzyme Q10, this is an antioxidant made in the body needed for basic cell function. And heart failure patients often have low levels of coenzyme Q10, and heart failure may decrease synthesis and increase demand for coenzyme Q10. And the theory that repletion may prevent oxidative stress and further myocardial damage, but routine supplements are not recommended at this time and further research is needed unless the patient is also on an HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor and then we do recommend the CoQ10 due to a side effect of the drug. Looking at energy needs, so the needs depend on dry weight, activity restrictions, and the severity of heart failure. And so looking at the obese, 
A hypocaloric diet may reduce stress on the heart and reduce weight, but we don't want the patient to become malnourished. And so patients with severe heart failure, though, may have 30 to 50 percent higher needs. And so, for example, we may often see this as 31 to 35 calories per kilogram. And patients with cardiac cachexia may even need 1.6 to 1.8 when using the mifflin saint Gior equation. Looking at fats, omega-3s can lower triglycerides and help prevent atrial fibrillation, which is cardiac arrhythmia in the atria, aka AFib, and perhaps reduces mortality rates in heart failure. But again, this is not directly affecting the heart failure. And so feeding strategies for heart failure patients, again, we recommend small frequent feeds as these will be better tolerated. And then we may use supplements to help increase energy intake such as Boost or Ensure. High intakes of folate and vitamin B6 are associated with reduced mortality from heart failure and stroke. Magnesium deficiency is common in heart failure patients due to diuretics and patients may need a magnesium supplement. Heart failure patients are at risk for a thiamine deficiency due to poor intake, advanced age, and the use of loop diuretics. And a supplement can help improve left ventricular ejection fraction. Vitamin D may improve inflammation in heart failure patients, but it's unclear if supplementation is needed or recommended at this time. Next, we'll take a look at cardiac transplantation. So conditions sometimes causing heart failure, in which case a heart transplant may be recommended includes things like inoperable coronary artery disease with congestive heart failure, cardiomyopathy, which is the weakening of the heart muscle for ver from various causes, inoperable heart valve disease with congestive heart failure, severe congenital heart disease without other surgical options, and life-threatening abnormal heart rhythms that do not respond to other therapies. Cardiomyopathies often lead to heart failure, including dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And so cardiac transplant is the only cure for end-stage heart failure. Now, careful selection of recipients, though, is imperative due to the limited donor hearts available. So you can imagine, right, we only take hearts from cadaverous donors. Since you can't live without a heart, this isn't like a kidney. And again, while patients have two lungs, right, or other organs, right, or two kidneys, when, someone, when an organ donor passes away, they only have one heart. So we have to be very selective to make sure that the patient's gonna get the most benefit and survive the transplant. So the inclusion criteria includes end-stage heart disease, not remediable by more conservative measures, an estimated life expectancy of less than one year without transplant, a solid agreement that previous medical therapy has been optimal and that no medical therapy or surgical procedure other than transplantation offers realistic expectation of extension of life and functional improvement and strong family support to help the patient emotionally before and after the surgery. Now exclusion criteria or for those that would not receive a heart transplant includes an age of more than 65 years, irreversible pulmonary hypertension or elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, active malignancy or a history of malignancy with a probability of recurrence, although exceptions are made for some types of skin cancer, so if you ever had a mole removed, etc. Inability to comply with complex medical regimens, which is again going to the previous inclusion criteria and compliance. Severe peripheral or cerebrovascular disease. Irreversible dysfunction of another organ such as the kidney, liver, and lung, including diseases that may limit prognosis after heart transplant active systemic infections, so infections in the blood, lung, urine, or elsewhere, or open wounds, and other life-threatening diseases likely to severely limit the length of life, even if the transplant were successful, or to severely limit the quality of life. So again, with only one heart to donate, we want to make sure that the people that are going to get them are going to get maximum benefit and take good care of them. So again, a heart transplant is a major surgery at 4 to 12 hours or longer. Now, to be fair, though, when it comes to organ transplants, so the first human heart transplant was done in 1967. So we've been doing these for a long time, and we're actually pretty darn good at heart transplants. Now, nutrition support before and after the transplant is crucial to decrease morbidity and mortality. And nutrition care for heart transplant patients is divided into three phases, pre-transplant, immediate post-transplant, and long-term post-transplant. 
pre-transplant, we're looking at lifestyle changes, including restriction of alcohol, losing weight, exercising, uh, cessation from smoking, and eating a low-sodium diet. And so what we want to see is, again, the Goldilocks, where a weight of less than 80% or more than 140% of ideal body weight increases the risk for infection, diabetes, morbidity, and mortality. Hyperlipidemia and hypertension reduce survival rates. And if PO intake is inadequate, then enteral nutrition should be initiated. Again, we don't want them to be too skinny or malnourished going into a major surgery. So looking at immediate post-transplant, so our goals are to provide adequate protein and calories to treat catabolism and promote healing, monitor and correct electrolyte abnormalities, and achieve optimal blood glucose control. Now energy and protein needs are increased due to steroid-induced catabolism, surgical stress, and anabolism and wound healing. And you wanna make sure that the patient progresses from clear liquids to a soft diet as soon as possible. And we may need to use enteral nutrition or supplements to maintain adequate intake. Now here we have again, so short-term post-transplant nutrient recommendations. So if you wanna see the numbers, again, we're seeing slightly, we're seeing higher protein, higher calories, carbs, Lipids, again, you may see a little bit higher, just to make sure people are getting adequate calorie intake, not being excessive on fluid, but still getting adequate fluid, looking at sodium, which may be a little bit higher than the previous sodium restriction, and then again, right, so FOS, magnesium, and bicarbonate are all going to be individualized. For long-term post-transplant, again, we're looking at so the long-term risk for hypertension, excessive weight gain, hyperlipidemia, osteoporosis, and infection, so again, these patients are on an immunosuppressive drug regimen, which increases triglycerides and LDL. And again, this is a lifelong medication that's required to not reject the organ. The other major issue is that because it is immunosuppressive, these patients are at very high risk from foodborne illness because they do not have the normal immune response. We need to make sure that we have food safety in mind. The other issue with corticosteroids, right, is increased blood glucose, sodium retention, increased appetite, and altered calcium absorption. All right, so let's take a look at some practice questions. So an atherogenic lipid profile is characterized by, and this is answer choice A, high LDL, low HDL, and high triglycerides. Number two, lifestyle risk factors that increase the risk of cardiovascular disease include And this is answer choice C, tobacco use and physical inactivity. Number three, recommendations for people with hypertension include, and this is answer choice D, all of the above. Number four, hypertriglyceridemia can be treated with, And this is answer choice A, omega-3 fatty acids. And number five, the energy needs for a patient with advanced heart failure are, this is answer choice D, 31 to 35 calories per kilogram. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions.